I would like to introduce Lars Vigar. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at NXP Semiconductors. Similar to uh, Dragos, Lars has been one of our earlier supporters uh, at the XTC. Um, in his daily work as CTO, Lars has the honor of having a first sneak peek into the future as he works closely with customers to drive and adapt new technological experiences. NXP's focus relies on automotive, industrial, mobile, smart home and communication infrastructures and smart cities. NXP smart transportation technologies are at the heart of over 750 cities worldwide. So with that, Lars is going to be speaking to us on the opportunities and challenges in transportation and smart cities. Lars, welcome and take it away. Good morning, Rajiv. Hey, uh, thanks. Can you, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Yes, perfect. Hey, I tried to start my presentation here to share it. Uh, ah, and now it works. Okay, I was a bit too early prior. So uh, I hope you all can see my intro slide. Rajiv, yes, is can. it working? Yes, we Perfect. can. Perfect. Hey, so um, yeah, uh, a big thanks for, for, for giving me the time to, to speak here. And I'm uh, really excited, of course, uh, to be in, in front of such an, uh, yeah, uh, high caliber entrepreneurial gang here. Um, uh, let me quickly introduce uh, me as a person uh, and NXP uh, as a company, and um, uh, then you will uh, you will understand that I'm only here to tell you that I have the coolest job in the entire industry. But that was an accident and not a plan. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, I'm 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 all yours after the presentation for for all sorts of questions. Uh, and uh, uh, please uh, don't uh, don't hesitate uh, shooting any any uh, interesting topics uh, at me. So. What is it that is moving all of us, uh, uh, I guess most of you, me for sure, uh, already as a, as a kid, uh, uh, the dream to doing something special. And uh, that, is, uh, that is pretty, um, uh, pretty common uh, with a lot of us uh, because uh, if you start a company, if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, if you want to be an innovator, um, uh, yeah, I would say, or psychologists would maybe also say, uh, you are largely achievement driven. And uh, that was also what was driving me as a kid, uh, doing something meaningful, doing something that others recognize. Um, but uh, uh, it was not clear how to, how to achieve these things. Uh, and uh, well, I'm, I'm a physicist by education with an MBA, um, but that also was not planned. That was uh, more or less uh, coming as an, as an accident, uh, of course, with some talent in the, in the natural sciences, uh, otherwise it does not work. But uh, from there, I wanted to become a, a, a medical doctor, so started studying medicine and also uh, wanted to build a medical equipment. Uh, might have been a good uh, good move in the current COVID crisis, uh, but um, uh, finally I got stuck in electronics on my way to that uh, medical devices, uh, made it into Infineon, then Siemens Video and Continental for automotive connected cars, uh, and then uh, joined NXP in 2012 as uh, the automotive strategist, and uh, yeah, made my way uh, into into the CTO position, and. Um, uh, yeah, maybe to explain what that NXP is, uh, like other companies, uh, so like Siemens uh, with Infineon, uh, Motorola with Freescale, for example, Philips had also spun out its semiconductor division in the early 2000s. Uh, so 2005, I think, uh, the spin out happened. Um, these, these semiconductor divisions of these big corporations had become too, too uh, volatile. And uh, yeah, the big corporations wanted to get rid of that risky uh, portfolio piece. Uh, they moved them all out. Uh, NXP got spun out into private equity, uh, like Freescale from, from Motorola. Uh, Infineon went uh, directly to the uh, stock exchange. And um, these, these companies all were the, the semiconductor branches, as I said, of these big corporations, and therefore, were supplying these big corporations and this big corporation portfolio. So Philips largely entertainment and TV uh, centric, uh, Infineon uh, uh, yeah, from, from uh, power plant, uh, energy management uh, centric, uh, automotive centric and so on. And um, the, the vicious thing in all of these uh, spin outs was as you always do it, you spin out a certain piece of a corporation 
anchor the debt directly on that on that corporation and private equity uh, acquires it. So when I joined in 2008 NXP, uh, soon after the economic downturn hit us, so the last one, 2008, and I honestly had thought uh, at that moment in time that I had made the biggest mistake in my life. Yeah. So I can uh, still remember the moment when I called my wife and said, hey, I'm in Hamburg now. My family still lived in southern Germany. And uh, I said, I'm going to be back in six weeks because we, we will be bankrupt soon. Um, in the meantime, NXP is one of the most profitable semiconductor companies globally, uh, number five uh, globally in scale uh, outside of the memory uh, area. And uh, we had been profitable enough to be able to buy free scale semiconductors in 2015. So that was the old Motorola semiconductors. So old Philips semiconductors married old Motorola semiconductors. And the very cool thing in that entire uh, uh, marriage was that this gave us an almost complete portfolio for, and now listen, smart connected devices. What that basically is, is the smart watches, a lot of smart speakers, a lot of manufacturing robots, uh, and for example, 50% uh, of a seven series BMW are equipped with NXP silicon. So NXP in that sense would be the only semiconductor company on the planet that is able to build an autonomous, electric driven, connected vehicle out of its own silicon. And I'm not saying that we have always the best silicon at hand, but I could build a complete device. And what you see there is our lead markets here on this slide in the company. It's basically automotive, 50% of the company revenue, industrial, quite a significant part, mobile, and there it's big time the mobile payment uh, applications. So uh, what you have in your uh, smartphones when you, when you wanna uh, have contactless payment in your credit cards, contactless payment, but also in your passports. So 80% of all biometric chips and passports, crypto chips are delivered by NXP. And what we are also shipping is a lot of 4G and 5G infrastructure electronics. So base stations and antenna electronics. With all this portfolio, um, my job has changed over the last 12 years, big time. 12 years ago, I was running to our customers like Dragos had said it, and these tier twos were of course discussing with the car OEMs uh, to stay in the automotive example. And we were coming and said, hey, we have a new CAN transceiver. But that of course was super unsexy and boring. The car OEM said, yeah, thank you. Uh, leave your data sheet here. And when we, when we need a CAN transceiver, we'll uh, probably uh, look at it. Since 2015, as we have this complete portfolio, we are much more tied into systems discussions. And like Drago said earlier, the idea of the OEMs is of course, to be upstream in the value chain, to identify uh, disruptive uh, needle moving technology, and therefore discussing with us much, much earlier than that happened the years before. So in other words, in the meantime, I get regularly the question and amazingly by the premium car OEMs, hey Lars, if you would have to build one, how would you build a car? And in the end, I was like, oh, sorry guys, I'm, I'm a semiconductor dude. I have nothing to add here for, for, for car uh, building. And they said, no, no, don't worry. You tell us how you would electronically architect a car. And then the premium car maker will make sure that this car is never rusting, that you have com uh, comfort leather seats in your car, that your doors are closing with a soft click and that you can uh, easily drive a German example, 250 kilometers an hour on the left lane on a motorway. That is our part. But you please tell us how the architecture should look like. How does this manual device get converted into an autonomous device in the future? And that of course has big implications. Also you see the gray boxes here in smart home and smart city. So, NXP overall, 30,000 employees. I'm responsible for 6060 R&D centers all around the globe. Um, almost uh, 10,000 uh, engineers uh, we have. And of course, uh, yeah, you can, you can imagine that is a, that is a true global uh, ecosystem. Alone, our site in Hamburg has more than 40 nationalities uh, in, in one uh, small site. And uh, that, is, that is pretty much the, 
the, the nature that also helps us. And diversity is not only a nice buzzword, but it's helping us big time also to, to generate our innovation. Because uh, if, if only guys like me, so 50 year old, uh, gray hair, men, three kids, one retriever uh, uh, and, and one, uh, one SUV car in front of the house uh, would be the stereotype for the entire company, then our view to the world and, and uh, our innovation power would be pretty limited. So the active interaction with all of our very different people around the globe is for me the breeding ground for our great and disruptive and market leading technologies. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples what I, what I mean by that. So what is it that is potentially the biggest value driver that we see? Well, looking back maybe one, one, one precursor. When I was a young, young kid, my grandfather already was a pretty old man. So he was born in 1900. And uh, I'm born in 1970. Uh, he passed away in, in, in 1998, so almost 100 years old. Um, and I once sat with him and I discussed with him what he had witnessed over his life uh, in terms of disruptive innovation. And I'm saying this because we are always claiming that we are at the moment in the, in the era of the mega disruptive innovations and of the big needle moves. Seriously? I mean, look at, at my grandpa. He was born in 1900 on a small farm in Northern Germany. And then he saw planes, electricity, refrigerators, dishwashers, washing machines, uh, TVs, color TVs, uh, uh, penicillin, organ transplants, uh, two world wars, uh, wars unfortunately, that, uh, that we had started here in Germany, um, uh, 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 people on the moon, uh, uh, all of these crazy things, PCs, mobile phones, and all of that. And the disruption that we see here at the moment is just appearing so big to us next to those disruptions that he had seen because we have a trend that is broken now since a couple, a couple of thousand years. Until recently, our world was a complete manual world. And what I mean by that is the following. I had a smart home 30 years ago. When I was coming back from vacation, I was using the last coins that I had in my foreign currency putting them into a phone booth, calling my neighbors and said, hey, I'm back tomorrow evening. Can you please switch on the heating system in my house? That was my manual smart home, calling my neighbors and then uh, mm -hmm. hope, uh, hope they, uh, they, 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 they tune my house uh, in the right conditions. Today, I am in an on-demand world. So as Queen said it 30 years ago, uh, I want it all and I want it now. Um, it's basically, I'm running out of the building I'm pushing on my smartphone. I said, I want to have an Uber and I want to have it now. So basically this on-demand world, I get everything in the shortest period of time, my Amazon deliveries, my transport. And what is happening now is we're going to do the next step and say we want to be in an ahead of demand world. And that is what is perceived as this big disruption. And this ahead of demand world basically means that you have a world around you that anticipates your wishes and automates these actions, uh, these wishes. And what that means is a pretty cool thing for us as NXP, because that means that you need loads of electronic helpers around you, or in my language, smart connected devices. And the forecast is pre-COVID, I have to say, don't know how the market figures are looking at the moment, the forecast is that in 2025, there is 75 billion smart connected devices out there on the globe, 75 billion. And compared to a couple of million cloud systems, big storage, big compute, the lucky thing is that NXP's portfolio is on that side of the 75 billion smart connected devices. And what are the ingredients for these smart connected devices? Because you could uh, say, no, of course, yeah, that's, uh, that's a nice try. Yeah? A smartwatch and a autonomous vehicle. I mean, there's quite a bit of a scale in between. Yeah? Um, yes, that is all true. Nevertheless, all of these devices, and that's the advantage of a CTO, you can 
reach a very, very high abstraction and flight level and simplify the world. These devices are all built with the same building blocks. You sense your environment then, and failure free because otherwise you have, uh, you have issues yeah, when you, when you uh, don't see a truck in front of you and you crash into it, for example. So failure free sensing. Then you have to think of a smart advice if your own brain is too small, you have to connect to someone who knows the answers, so connect to the cloud. And then if you have made, if you have calculated your smart advice, send this advice to the arms and legs of your robot. Sense, think, connect, act. The four building blocks for either your smart thermostat or your autonomous vehicle. For the autonomous vehicle, I gave you ex the example, but also for the thermostat, you sense that Lars is approaching Hamburg airport, the plane is gonna land. Then my smart thermostat thinks, uh, okay, uh, is every, uh, anyone else in the house or is he uh, or will he be alone? Um, what is his favorite temperature? What's the outside temperature? Uh, then ideally the smart thermostat connects to the, to the cloud and finds out that my favorite soccer club is playing uh, that evening, and if they play as they always play, uh, Lars needs a lot of beer and pizza to calm down again. So basically, pre-ordered uh, food for the evening is there, and all that advice is either sent to the to the uh, uh, pizza delivery uh, agency or to the central heating of my house. All simple, all clear. You can use this concept all along. The great value creator on top of that for someone who has a complete portfolio is trust your device. You do not want to have these helpers around you if you cannot trust your devices. You will never tolerate a flattening iron for your shirts next uh, in your house if you're not sure that this thing does not burn down your house. So it's a very old trend here. You don't want to have dangerous devices next to you. So functional safety is clear, but also crypto security is clear. You do not want to have a connected fridge if you cannot be sure that this thing never orders 500 liters of milk for you for the weekend, just uh, because someone has hacked it. Yeah. So these type of things, sense, think, connect, act, safety and security, six technical areas. If I only can manage them best in class, I'm world champion in our industry and no one, no one can compete with me. Now, Looking into the transportation, smart transportation era, um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here and try to uh, try to illustrate a bit what that that abstract talk in real life means for me, and uh, what the um, what the different trends are that we are at the moment fueling with our semiconductors and how uh, our world will change over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So, megacities. Uh, at the first hand, will not work without the transportation and will not work with traditional transportation, uh, the space in the roads, in the, uh, the, uh, the um, normal constraints that we have in, in most of the mega cities around the globe, especially in the ones in the emerging countries, uh, will constrain us in a way that the traditional ways uh, will be, uh, will be uh, needing adaptation. So 10 billion people by 2050, according to the UN, Smart cities will only work if we get smarter in transportation or, and that's the, the ultimate level of smartness, if we avoid transportations where it's not absolutely necessary. And you see this at the moment in the, in the uh, COVID lockdowns, there is a lot of transportation that we can avoid. And guys like me even enjoy not having always 300,000 air miles at the end of the year or even more uh, collected, uh, but uh, working for, for a couple of weeks or months even from home office. And uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that we normally do works very well. But we have three categories that we need to look at. This is movement of people, movement of goods, and then what I said prior, avoidance of transport but movement of data. So let me quickly dive into those three segments and to give you a couple of examples. Um, the automotive part, as Drago said, is maybe the, the uh, flagship area for all these discussions around smart connected devices. Why? Because they are the most expensive smart connected devices. 
and they are the most complicated smart connected devices. For an autonomous vehicle, we are estimating that in future those level four devices have up to a billion lines of software code. Today, modern vehicles have in the range of 150 to 200 million lines of code. And that is already by orders of magnitude more complicated than spaceships. That is more complicated than entire big software ecosystems like Facebook, Windows, or, or these type of, uh, of devices. Uh, jet fighters, uh, well, I thought as a kid uh, that they are the, uh, the ultimate uh, technological innovation. Uh, spaceships and jet fighters, uh, complete nonsense. They are by, by orders of magnitude simpler than just a premium car. And what that basically means is a connected car needs to be architectured in future in a different way than it was architected 10 years ago, because you neither can produce it anymore, nor can you qualify it anymore. And if you cannot qualify it sufficiently in the sufficient amount of money and time, you can never optimize the functional safety and the crypto security so that you can trust your device. And untrustworthy cars you don't want to have around you because they are killer machines. So with that, great example, how do you build cars of the future? And what we do there, of course, is as always, when we don't have an answer, we try to look around, we try to steal, in other words, copy from other industries what we can do. Well, and the IT industry is, of course, a, a fantastic uh, a test bed here. If you look at the big office building, what has the IT industry done uh, over decades, uh, decades already? Said, okay, we have on one floor, maybe a hundred offices. On each of those floors, we have a domain controller, a data router that is aggregating the data. And that data router is connected then to the main gateway of the building your server room and, and pumps the data to and from the, the uh, office building. Well, why don't we do this with a car? Just assume we have five floors in our car, or in other words, five domains, which is infotainment and in-vehicle experience. So in your old car, you would have called this the radio navigation system. You have body and comfort electronics, light, climate control, access control, and you have a powertrain combustion engine or electric vehicle, vehicle dynamics, ABS, ESP systems. But by and large, every car out there on the road has infotainment, body and comfort, and powertrain as domains. The entire hype over the last six, seven years, 10 years came in because there is connectivity. So you try to get connected via cellular and Wi-Fi networks uh, in your car like you are in your, your house car to car communication, of course, coming in and other uh, of those standards. And the most hyped or even overhyped domain is the driver replacement domain. So ADAS or highly automated driving that we have here, the entire game of getting Lars out of the driver seat and putting a robot into the driver seat. So in other words, if you can separate those domains from each other, your car will get much, much cheaper in how it can be built. Why? because your connectivity domain has to be highly crypto secure, so hacking secure, because that is the only uh, entrance door from the internet into your vehicle. So if hackers really want to hack car fleets, they will attack via the cellular network, your connectivity domain. On the other hand, in your powertrain domain, you have your braking system. The braking system is not exposed to the internet here. In this diagram, you would have a firewall in the connectivity area, you would have a firewall in the gateway in between, and then you would have, of course, again, firewalls in your powertrain domain controller. So at least three firewalls before you can reach your brakes, that is pretty secure, but your brakes have to have highest functional safety. So they must never, 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 ever fail because otherwise they would create a fatality, high likelihood. So functional safety for your brakes is one class of semiconductors. Crypto security in your connectivity is another class of functionality in your connectivity domain. So connectivity and powertrain have very different requirements. The good news is you don't have to, to bring 
both into one piece of semiconductor because that is hardly financeable and hardly doable. So the smartest architecture thinking here will help you a lot in overcoming the challenges going forward. And that is, of course, in the advanced driver assistance systems. So, for example, in the radar sensing parts, in the um, uh, functional safety microcontroller areas, um, very, very important because you can imagine how complicated uh, these areas are these ADAS systems or advanced driver assistance systems are basically what Dragos mentioned a couple of times prior as well. They are the, the needle moving things of giving more and more your manual driving tasks over to an autonomous system. Now, there is a lot of hype, there is a lot of overhype, and there is a lot of disappointment also coming. Why? Because the industry three, four years talked to the press um, uh, and that was uh, was also a thing maybe maybe important to to add to Nisha's uh, presentation this morning. There had been very overhyped statements in the press, and the picture had been created that um, in, in in a couple of quarters your car is more intelligent than you as the driver has more emotions than you. Your kids are all driving to the kindergarten autonomously. Um, and uh, uh, everyone will only use shared vehicles. No one ever questioned whether this really is true, but it was good. It was a good story for Wall Street. Give us your money, finance startups. What you then see suddenly is very, very overvalued, overheated startups, and they are collapsing shortly after again, because of course, this, this is a dream that has been created there that is not realistic. And level five cars, by and, large, by and large, so completely driverless vehicles will not be bought over the next decade by a lot of us private consumers. But for companies like Lyft and Uber, this story was important because they could go to Wall Street and they could say, hey guys, uh, 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 we have a new, new uh, idea in business. We make our transportation 30% cheaper because we take out the driver out of the, the, the taxi driver equation 30% cheaper, so we are the taxi company of, this, of the future, give us your money. For all the others, for my dad, yeah, uh, 80, 81 years old now in the meantime, a level three or level four car is what he wants to have. Why? Because he li he's living 500 kilometers away from me. And what he wants to do is, he wants to manually drive the 10 miles to the highway, but then he wants to press a button and say, car, drive me on that restricted highway area autonomously. Highway assist systems. We have them already in the market today. And after 300, 400 kilometers of driving, the car wakes him up again and says, well, either you take over the control now and drive the last 10 miles to last manually, or I stop you here and I park the car. So these highway assist systems are of a very high relevance and we are developing them at the moment and industrializing them. A fully autonomous vehicle, level five under all circumstances, is not needed for most of us. So what Drago said prior, there can be very wrong moments in time for companies to introduce technology and to make high-flying pitches. There can be very, very wrong moments in time for startups to make certain claims. And honestly, it is not true what I have heard prior to say you can be too late in technology. The biggest danger in my opinion for companies is that you are too early in technology. You spend, sorry for my wording, shitloads of money on an early technology and the fast followers just wait until there is the first market uptake and then invest with two technology generations better than what you have. In semiconductors, that would mean you're developing your ADA systems in 10 nanometers. And in five, six years, the market takes up and the transistors are already at five or three nanometers in size. So in other words, uh, an order of uh, magnitude or two, um, more power consuming and, and more performing. And then no one will, of course, buy your old uh, outdated technology anymore. So watch out, be very, very careful with that moment in time and try to to, uh, to uh, make all your consistency checks, um, when is the right moment in time?
another story that we have at the moment literally in our pockets um, is a technology that was uh, yeah was completely dead already until two years ago we call it ultra wideband and ultra wideband was a tech development that was very um, uh, similar to wi-fi so it was meant as a rival to wi-fi um, Uh, transmitting in the nine gigahertz uh, band, uh, like like your standard uh, uh, home Wi-Fi, and it is completely dead. And and I guess it will uh, be uh, also in future as a communication technology. The only funny thing with ultra wideband is you can measure the runtime of signals. So in other words, if Rajiv and myself are in the same room, and we have both an ultra wideband device in our pockets. The, the measuring, uh, the, the signal runtime from my device to Rajiv and the answering time back to my device can be measured. And with that, we can, by the speed of light, exactly by the centimeter, determine how far my device is away from Rajiv's device. Now you will say, okay, Alas, but okay, uh, nice, but what do you need it for? Well, the funny thing is, that is the next generation of car keys already. We have it just introduced in the automotive market because this is a very, very robust technology, robust against hacking. And for the ones of you who are interested, there is relay station attacks uh, in old car key technologies where you have thieves who can trick the old systems. You cannot not do that anymore with these ultra wideband technologies because you're just saying I'm opening up the car only for my key in the pocket if the user is closer than half a meter or one meter to the car. Um, uh, if there is a, a bit uh, an ambiguous signal, I don't open up the car. Now, that is a nice story in itself. The cool thing happened when suddenly the mobile phone producers mid of last year started putting that onto their mobile phones. So the next generation mobile phones have ultra wideband chips on board. And the Cupertino company has already uh, uh, ultra wideband in the, in the uh, generation 11, but also all the Android uh, guys are gonna, are gonna uh, uh, bring in ultra wideband into, uh, into the mobile phones. And now suddenly what that means is the mobile phones are up integrating another functionality. They are up integrating the key ring that you normally have in your pocket. So what has happened over the industry? PCs had existed in the 1980s for driving the semiconductor industry. Then someone ripped the, mobile, uh, the, the phones off the wall, made mobile phones out of them. Then uh, Mr. Jobs came along and made a smartphone out of a computer in a phone. Then an NXP came and helped these companies putting the wallet into the phone with the, with the uh, contactless payment. And now companies like NXP come and help putting your key ring also into your mobile phone. So in other words, the mobile phone will become your universal, can become your universal key. And you can access hotel rooms, your front door of your house. And if you're walking in your house with this accurate positioning, you can even do things like your sound Uh, bubble, uh, uh, your, your favorite sound and your favorite light follows you as you are running around in your house from the living room to the kitchen to the bathroom and so on. So all of that fantastic technologies to remove barriers or obstacles in your life to generate an ahead of Uh, demand world. So before you know that you have to, to switch on the light in the living room and that the music should follow you, it just seamlessly follows you just because it knows that you are changing, changing uh, uh, location. That of course also can be, can be expanded then to outside of vehicle transportation. So just imagine you have these types of, uh, of uh, yeah, key electronics with you. Then of course you can use this to seamlessly open a gate at an airport. Um, to, uh, so no, no download of any, any, any uh, uh, airport tickets anymore, no barcode reading, uh, these type of stuff. In principle, you could even use that for social distancing. And in the COVID crisis, of course, we are playing a lot with these type of technologies. So knowing exactly where you are uh, helps, of course, a lot knowing how many people are in a certain radius around you. We can go even further than that. Um, 
because all of these devices are battery driven. And how cool would it be if you would have normal RFID or contactless chips, like in your contactless credit card, NFC type of chips? How cool would it be if you would have these type of chips and they are readable over 10 meters of distance? We have these chips in our portfolio and they are called RAIN RFIDs. So this is a standard for RFID tags and you see that red tag here at the, at the suitcase. I have such a tag at the windscreen of my car and it works like a contactless badge there again. My car drives to the NXP gate. The reader outside of the, of the uh, or at the gate reads the tag that is at my windscreen over a distance of 15 meters and opens the gate. So this works like an ultra long distance uh, contactless badge. And that is of course fantastic if you are driving a complete truckload of goods into a warehouse. If you are working in warehouse uh, uh, areas, you know where on which shelf which product is and you can even read out what has been uh, packed in, a, in, a, in, in, in one box in a smart warehouse. So you don't need camera systems. Uh, you have immediately the right t-shirt sizes and so on. And, and uh, superstores like Decathlon or others, they are starting heavily to use this type of electronics. In other words, they use this to make goods, analog goods in the analog world visible in the digital, um, uh, digital world. I played with that some years ago. So I took one of those stickers glued it into the school bag of my little daughter. And we put a reader here in my little village to the traffic light in front of the school. And suddenly the traffic light could see that there is a little pupil, a girl on her way to school, which is very, very nice because if you have a bus gate opening, 40 of those uh, little devils running out uh, towards the traffic light, the traffic light immediately sees I should give priority to these vulnerable road users. And then what we did is via our NXP car to car communication. I could over 500 meters of distance warn guys like me and say, hey Lars, slow down in front of the traffic light. I'm anyhow switching to red in 10 seconds. So you better slow down and recuperate your energy. But after that, uh, uh, let the kids pass and uh, uh, I can, I can uh, ideally uh, exactly uh, tell you when and how to start driving again or slow down and you will get a green wave. So in other words, making a lot of these analog topics visible in the digital uh, uh, world helps us, of course, uh, anticipating and automating. Now, that entire thing I said already, we can put into clothing. So uh, I have a couple of t-shirts here in my office uh, where we have these tags in. So uh, this is at the moment uh, in, in heavy use to making sure that you have the smartest possible supply chains. If you bring in really a, a big truck of goods, you know within a second which goods have moved into the warehouse, what has moved out and what is, what is where uh, in, the, um, in the chain. And that of course, all with the right cryptology. I talked about the car-to-car -car communication already. What we have done here is we have taken a Wi-Fi derivative, um, a Wi-Fi um, P standard, so IEEE 802.11p, and that is a highly um, uh, uh, robust, very accurate, so timing accurate um, communication technology just based uh, on the normal, normal uh, home Wi-Fi. With that, what you can do is you can have, for example, trucks communicating to each other and you, you can build truck platoons. So in other words, the first driver is manually driving and all the other trucks behind this manual driven truck are following like trucks hooked up on a tow bar at a very, very close distance. And why does that work? Well, if the first truck does an emergency braking, normally what you have is you have the first driver reacting and braking. Then it takes 200 milliseconds for the brake lights to come on. Then another second for the second driver to react and the entire thing uh, ripples through. So truck number five has a 10 second uh, later reaction start than truck number one. With such a car to car communication, you can communicate over one mile of distance in the open field, 500 meters in a city. So in other words, you have five trucks following each other and driver one does an emergency braking at three milliseconds delay, oh, three milliseconds, the brakes of truck number five start working. 
So in other words, these 10 seconds go down to three milliseconds. You can move the trucks closer to each other and you can start saving fuel. Truck number one saves 2% of fuel. Truck number two, who is driving in the slipstream of truck number one, saves 11%. Three saves 11%, truck number four, 11%, and the last truck saves 9%. So the overall fuel saving in these type of road trains is massive. Next to that, of course, you can communicate to your traffic lights here. You can see whether an ambulance is uh, driving from the side into a crossroads and so on and so on. So that is all stuff where we are with our crypto chips, making sure that the communication is secure, but that then there is a low latency, highly accurate, super robust communication. And that makes your sensing failure free and avoids fatalities on the road. Now, I've talked about a lot of transportation of physical or living goods. The other part is Greater Thunberg will only be happy with me if I do not transport at all. In other words, to communicate, to do what we are doing here is, I need to, call, to, to transport data rather than LAS. And that is, I guess most of you have also uh, experienced this. This is a pretty cool thing where I had been spending a lot of travel time Still in January uh, this year, first week was from Germany to Las Vegas for CES, then one week at home, then one week in India, then one week at home. I have done after that most of my work from this chair here. And uh, point one, I'm switching much faster to meetings. So my private personal uh, efficiency has gone up big time because I did not need to fly over to San Francisco to give you that pitch here, but I just was dialing in a quarter of an hour earlier. Secondly, uh, I'm not jet lagged. I'm healthy. I'm, I'm not worn out. Uh, I can do my, my job very nicely uh, from here. And uh, yeah, the quality of the presentation is also not bad. Now, what you need for that is, of course, the infrastructure. And for that infrastructure, you need good Wi-Fi systems. So there I will not dive too deeply into that, but the next generation Wi-Fi to operate in principle hundreds of devices from one household is of course a key thing and very sexy technology. And then making your data personal and private and make it really shareable with the ones who like to share it and protect it against espionage and hacking. That is of course one of the things that we are where a lot of value capture will be in future and where a lot of Space is for startups, for secure services, and where we are, of course, also very, very heavily investing in R&D and in research for these little Enigma crypto machines that you have in every microcontroller, but also in every, every banking card and in every dongle that you're plugging into a PC. Yeah. So basically, that is my view on the, on the challenge in um, uh, moving people, uh, goods, and ideally avoiding that and moving data in the, in the smart cities. Um, but what are the challenges? Or let's have a positive look at that. What are the areas where startups can create value, where we have opportunities for, for new features where customers will pay us for? Well, and that is safety, I said already, and security. That is efficiency. So power consumption, carbon footprint down. I mentioned that. It is also this convenience part. And I hope you, you got a bit my, my uh, story on uh, everything simple. So this barrier removal, I take obstacles away from you. Uh, uh, that is of course a, 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 a key part. And then last but not least, of course, the sustainability story, which is a consequence even out of this efficiency area here. What we have done as a company, maybe one, one side uh, story is, we have launched a green bond some three weeks ago. And green bond, normally you would, uh, you would understand uh, we, are, we are lending money from banks. And the green bond is, of course, uh, for a couple of uh, efficient uh, energy topics, uh, 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 investors want to give you money if you are very eco-friendly. In the meantime, the investment community woke up and they saw us in, in a way saying, okay, wow, that is awesome. And XP is moving the needle so much because that, that electronics is going everywhere and is the foundation for this eco-friendly and, and uh, energy saving uh, yeah, inventions in the future. 
So we got a very, very positive reaction there from the, from the market. Also an area definitely worth combining uh, what you have uh, on, on, your, uh, on your target list and what we as a big corporations can do here. And this is, of course, also one, one area uh, that, uh, that, that uh, yeah, triggers my interest in the, in the group of people that are here on the call, right? So you are in a unique position uh, with everything that you have. You are, you are exactly addressing the right values and the right uh, CSR goals. Um, and please uh, don't uh, hesitate. Reach out to the big corporations. We have not only because we are good corporate citizens, but also just because we want to do business. We have a really huge interest in, in being active in those areas. And also we need innovation support and thinking support uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to sharpen, sharpen our pencils and, uh, and, and uh, feed our R&D labs. So big thanks for that. Uh, I hope I, I did not bore you with my long monologue. And um, uh, Rajiv, uh, maybe with that, uh, back to you and uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm all yours for the questions. Thank you, Lars. Fantastic presentation as always. Uh, what fascinated me was the way that you laid out the whole landscape of, uh, you know, starting from where Dragos left off and then building the transportation area and smart cities. So I think that was really phenomenal. There are some questions. So I'm glad we have enough time for it. Um, for folks on the call, if you have questions, please use the raise hand feature. Um, and we can get to your questions or type them into chat. Uh, one of the questions that came in, uh, Lars, when you were presenting was from Joy, uh, was what is the current cost of a RAIN RFID tag? Uh, Joy, that is, uh, so it, it, it depends. Uh, that's always the nice salesman uh, question in the beginning. It depends, um, uh, but it does not depend on the silicon uh, uh, cost. So the chip in itself is a, is a couple of dollar cents. So, so um, in the high volume, uh, uh, below $10 cents, $5 cents maybe. The, the cost usually is modulated by how you then attach the antenna to it. So whether you only have a paper label with a printed antenna, very cheap, or whether you have an antenna, for example, even in a license plate. So my license plate has these RAIN RFIDs in, of course, you have a robust uh, a sticker. Uh, so they are usually the, the glue, the, the foil, uh, the antenna uh, can drive more cost, but by and large, we are working for the, for the uh, retail chains uh, in the range of a couple of dollar cents. All right, thank you, Lars. Uh, we have one more question. What is the biggest challenge in cybersecurity side of the smart world? And this is from Hisan from Sweetditch. Hisan, um, the biggest challenge is that, uh, that we have a lot of legacy devices out there in the world. And of course, you need to be able to update and upgrade those devices also over time. So what we are doing at the moment and, and what we try to do is uh, we try to uh, yeah, to define architectures to help our customers to um, to um, uh, securing uh, also legacy system and securing very heterogeneous systems. So um, uh, let, let me take the example of a house. Uh, you can you can have uh, a big fat door locks at your front door, uh, and if you're clever, also at your back door because otherwise the the, the door lock at the front door is is uh, is is uh, worthless, um, and you protect your house but that's not enough. Just assume you have a big house with uh, five wings. You have a castle, so my five domains, my five wings uh, in my car architecture. Um, you have an entrance hall and you call this entrance hall gateway. And in that entrance hall, you're normally putting then one or two uh, Doberman dogs. Uh, so your watchdogs, your security, uh, your firewall, and they are watching even if someone breaks your entrance door, uh, the, the dogs will immediately um, uh, yeah, alarm uh, you and, and, and uh, will, will uh, watch out and protect you. From there, you are moving on into the different wings of your, of your building. And every room that you have is, again, protected with a door lock, but much lower security level, of course. But these are the microcontrollers in your, in your control units. Uh, each of them have a certain level of security. And on the aisles, you also have surveillance systems. So in your networks, in your in-vehicle networks, uh, uh, for example, uh, you have anomaly detection. Your security system or your fully secure house 
will only be be uh, re really well set up if you have all of that. And if you're compromising on one side, you are immediately having a big weakness. Doing this security trainings, security understanding, teaching the world what we are doing, and not only talking about a big fat front door door lock. That is one of the biggest challenges. And sorry for my monologue. No, thank you, Lars. Um, we have a question from Regi Wayu of Hara, and I believe he's in Indonesia. Um, his question is, with all these data points that are generated automatically in the automotive industry, how is the utilization of those data points supporting the industry? So as an example, insurance industry is using the data to automate the claims process and giving more benefits to the users. So for yeah, the automotive I think so, industry, so, so good. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Good, good, good evening to Indonesia. Um, um, uh, maybe one, one interesting point here, and that is very, very important for startups to understand and to, to realize. Who is the owner of this big data? You are fully right with your question that normally a modern car is a rolling sensor platform, creates loads of data, and that data is super attractive. I give you an example. If I would own all the Volkswagen and BMW cars here in Germany on the road, I can exactly tell you where the suspension systems have a challenge, or in other words, if I take this data and give it to the munip uh, municipalities, um, uh, I, I can say very clearly, sorry, you have potholes here in the road. I can identify the potholes. Go fix them and your roads are in better condition. You don't need measurement or surveillance uh, uh, teams there who, who check the roads. So big data is worth quite some money. The only point is who is owning that big data? And it's typically the car OEM who is owning that data. And why is the car OEM owning that data? Because the car OEM has the end customer relationship. So the person who has the end customer relationship can come to Lars and say, hey Lars, if you buy a new car, if you buy from Dragos a new Ford, um, would you be willing to, to give your statistical driving data to Ford? And Lars, you get as a return of, of that trade, you get three years of map updates for free. And I have a relationship with the Ford dealer immediately. And I sign this and I say, yes, okay, that is, uh, that is what I want to do. Anyone else in the supply chain only has access to that big data if the car OEM lets you have access. So in other words, a Conti, a Bosch, an NXP. We have no chance to forcing anyone to give us that data. And this is very often the make or break for someone who wants to exploit that data. An insurance company has no power because in principle, they would need to go to Volkswagen or to Ford and would say, can I have that data? When they strike the deal, it's okay. But it's not like I set up such a big data company and then everyone will deliver me that data free of charge. So there is huge barriers of access in that market. And if you have it, out of any question, you can exploit loads of value out of it. The only issue is you will not easily get it. Thank you, Lars. Um, while you were presenting, one part of your, the conversation was very interesting to me. It was on timing. And you <laughs> said between hype and reality, what is achievable? So you specifically, you said, what is the right moment in time? Yes. Given our startups audience and where they aspire to go, um, what do you, what are your, uh, feedback points on when is the right time to go to market and to approach companies like NXP or others with their innovations and technologies? Well, so uh, Rajiv, thanks for, for coming back to that one. I mean, usually uh, 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 startups can fall very easily victim to this um, uh, rush because you can be too late type of, uh, of thing. And that is True, of course, uh, for a couple of, of startups, but for the, for the vast minority. Um, I have seen much more startups being too early, uh, having not, not the full control of, a, of, a, of an uh, ecosystem, and then uh, yeah, uh, drying up or, or, or uh, being too early with the investments uh, and others then reap the benefits of what these early, early movers uh, have created. Um, so therefore, the... Key 
the very important uh, considerations right from the beginning are how do I scale and what is the right moment? Am I too early or am I too late? And if you are too late, you still can be successful in the market. You very often will be successful in the market uh, because you are uh, just a follower and the fast followers are usually pretty successful. If you are too early, that can be very, very risky. So what I would do in each specific case, make sure that you are not stuck in these bullshit discussions, uh, and sorry for my, for my German bluntness here, in these bullshit discussions of uh, you have to hold all your cards to your chest and, and uh, uh, then suddenly the big success will come and you will rule the world. Um, I'm firmly convinced, and I see this in my daily life every day, is the best team players and the best collaborators will be successful. And that was, by the way, also what Dragos said prior, because he said, we are not working in a strict value chain anymore, but we try to open that up from an OEM side into a value network to see the most powerful contributors to an idea, and then we jointly turn it into success. So it might look in the beginning like your own company success or growth rate, it will not be an explosive unicorn type of trajectory, but very likely it is the much more powerful one if you have the big corporations behind you who can who can help you in the industrialization in the scaling and that is by the way what you have also seen with all these autonomy companies autonomous driving in the bay area i mean 5 years ago they had a huge valuation none of those companies have self driving serious vehicles in the market at the moment a lot of the the players there if they are still alive have been partnering with the big car corporations and they use their industrial exper uh, expertise and experience also to, to now merge from two sides. The one are disruptive innovators, the others are industrialization specialists. And with that, I, 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 so I, I mean, if you, if you wanna, wanna, wanna uh, talk about uh, the right level of paranoia that a startup always should have, for me, 90% of my paranoia energy would go into how do I partner in the right way and how, how do I open up ecosystems that will help me uh, identifying at the right point in time, the right move. Very insightful, Lars. Um, also during your presentation, you mentioned that you're in charge of about 60 R&D centers globally. And so all the technologies you spoke about, whether it was automotive, industrial, mobile, um, smart homes, smart cities, connectivity, you see them all that come yes. through. So we have a wi wide array of startups in XTC who focus on enabling technologies, IoT, transportation, smart cities. How do they get in touch with NXP or how do they make contact and which kind of startups do you look at actually? Well, uh, yeah, th thanks, very good question. Um, uh, we have a couple of uh, of NXP uh, ambassadors here on the on the uh, call. So Huawei, uh, uh, Wong Yam is is uh, regularly on here, but also uh, JP German, uh, one of my very close colleagues, uh, who is uh, in the Bay Area as our automotive uh, sales specialist. Uh, and uh, both Huawei and, and JP are are uh, close to my innovation teams in Austin and in Germany. And um, yeah, basically they are the technical scout scouting team next to our M&A scouting team. So Mark van der Kiebo and uh, Hawaii are, are here, uh, the relevant people for XTC. So Rajiv, what I would, uh, would do is if someone has, has the interest to, to reach out to NXP, uh, either uh, you provide these email addresses directly or uh, the two of us, uh, we connect uh, uh, and I'll try to, to dispatch uh, the right contact people. Yeah. That yeah, would be fantastic, the, Lars. Yes, we have Hawaii's contact and JP. Um, so that would be great to make the connection if any of the startups are interested and then move it further. Um, I think one more question that I had was um, about the data, right? So it's, it's a data world, it's a data-driven economy. And you mentioned, you know, the ownership of the data going to the consumers and they ultimately own it. Um, does NXP manage data also for OEMs and partners? How do you see the data economy? Yeah, well, well, yes, yeah. Uh, so, so of course, we are from, uh, from from our DNA. We are a, a chip maker, transistor shufflers, and so on. But of course, uh, yes, we are. We are deeply going into into software as well. 
Uh, and what we are doing is, especially on the on the secure and secure payment side, we are managing services. So, for example, for MyFair to Go, which is basically the transportation system for Melbourne and other big cities, we are managing the services uh, sometimes with partners, sometimes standalone, but also for banks. What so what we call the trust provisioning. So the enabling, disabling of banking cards and all the privacy uh, cryptology operations around it. We are managing um, uh, as a as a value add service as well. So I would not say that we are plain vanilla service company, but we have some uh, uh, centers of excellence for, for for service handling as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and uh, thank you, Lars, for taking the time to spend, uh, for you know, share uh, your insights uh, with the XTC uh, uh, startups as well as with the other partners. Um, and uh, it was a fascinating presentation. And uh, thank you also personally, as well as for the entire NXP team for supporting XTC uh, from the start and ongoing basis. So appreciate big, it. Big thanks and uh, yeah, very, very uh, exciting uh, group here. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward, of course, to the next steps and uh, yeah, what the Hawaii and then the JP come back. Right. Thanks Thank a lot you, for Lars. listening. Good day.